is matter around us pure it is such a simple question right but it really makes us think deep let's start with a super interesting chapter for grade 9 before we begin i want you guys to know that it is a simple walk through the chapter just concentrate well and you would be glad to realize that you picked up so many things while you were watching this video that it is no longer like a burden of studies it is like a beautiful walk in your favorite place and if you feel that way after you watch the video please please let us know in the comment section below because we love to hear from you how do you find out that the stuff you buy is pure or not milk ghee butter salt spices mineral water juice all the stuff that we buy from the market is it pure have you ever noticed the word pure written on the packs of these consumables for a common person pure means having no adulteration but for a scientist all these things are actually mixtures of different substances and hence not pure for example milk it is actually a mixture of water fat and protein when a scientist says that a substance is pure it means that all the constituent particles of that substance are same in their chemical nature a pure substance consists of a single type of particles in other words a substance is a pure single form of matter as we look around we can see that most of the matter around us exists as mixtures of two or more pure components for example sea water minerals soil etc are all mixtures well what is a mixture mixtures are constituted by more than one kind of pure form of matter we know that dissolved sodium chloride can be separated from water by the physical process of evaporation however sodium chloride is itself a pure substance and cannot be separated by physical processes into its chemical constituents similarly sugar is a substance which contains only one kind of pure matter and its composition is the same throughout whatever the source of a pure substance may be it will always have the same characteristic properties soft drink and soil are not single pure substances therefore we can say that a mixture contains more than one pure substance If you're liking the video please don't forget to hit the like button share it with your friends and subscribe to the channel also press the bell icon so that you can receive the future updates let's see some of the types of mixtures now depending upon the nature of the components that form a mixture we can have different types of mixtures let's perform an activity to understand it take a beaker a containing 50 ml of water and add one spatula full of copper sulfate powder then take beaker b containing 50 ml of water and add two spatula full of copper sulfate solution beakers a and b have obtained a mixture which has a uniform composition throughout such mixtures are called homogeneous mixtures or solutions compare the color of the solutions of the two beakers though both the groups have obtained copper sulfate solution but the intensity of the color of the solutions is different this shows that a homogeneous mixture can have a variable composition some other examples of such mixtures are salt dissolved in water and sugar dissolved in water Now take two more beakers C and D and add different amounts of copper sulfate and potassium permanganate or common salt which is sodium chloride and mix the given components to form a mixture. Beakers B and C would obtain 
physically distinct parts and have non-uniform compositions. Such mixtures are called heterogeneous mixtures. Some examples include iron fillings and salt, salt and sulfur, oil and water. Remember, a substance is a pure single form of matter that has definite properties and composition, for example, iron. However, mixtures are formed when two or more substances mix together without participating in a chemical change. Please know that the substances need not necessarily mix in a definite ratio to form a mixture. Now, what are the differences between homogeneous and heterogeneous mixtures? Homogeneous mixtures are the types of mixtures in which the components mixed are uniformly distributed throughout the mixture. Only one phase of matter can be observed. Remember, homo means same. Homogeneous mixtures are also called solutions. For example, rainwater is a homogeneous mixture. Heterogeneous mixtures are a type of mixture in which all the components are completely mixed and all the particles can be seen under a microscope. We can easily identify the components and more than one phase can be seen by naked eyes. Hetero means different. For example, chocolate chip cookies are an example of heterogeneous mixture. We just discussed that a solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. You come across various types of solutions in your daily life like soda water, lemonade, etc. Usually we think of a solution as a liquid that contains either a solid, liquid or a gas dissolved in it. But we can also have gaseous solutions like air, solid solutions like alloy. A metal alloy is a substance that combines more than one metal or mixes a metal with other non-metallic elements. For example, brass is an alloy of two metals, copper and zinc. Please note that alloys cannot be separated into their components by physical methods, but Still, an alloy is considered a mixture because it shows the properties of its constituents and it can have variable composition. In a solution, there is homogeneity at the particle level. For example, lemonade tastes the same throughout. This shows that particles of sugar or salt are evenly distributed in the solution. A solution has a solvent and a solute as its components. The components of the solution that dissolves the other component is usually the component present in larger amount and is called the solvent. However, the component of the solution that is dissolved in the solvent which is usually present in lesser quantity is called the solute. For example, a solution of sugar in water is a solid and liquid solution in which sugar is the solute and water is the solvent. A solution of iodine in alcohol, also known as tincture of iodine. Aerated drinks like soda water etc. are gas in liquid solutions. These contain carbon dioxide as solute and water as solvent. Air is a mixture of gas in gas. Air is a homogeneous mixture of a number of gases. Its two main constituents are oxygen and nitrogen. The other gases are present in very small quantities. Properties of a solution. A solution is a homogeneous mixture. The particles of a solution are smaller than 1 nanometer, that is 10 raised to the power minus 9 meter in diameter. So, they cannot be seen by naked eyes. 
because of the very small particle size solution do not scatter a beam of light passing through it so the path of light is not visible in a solution the solute particles cannot be separated from the mixture by the process of filtration the solute particles do not settle down when left undisturbed that is a solution is stable let's perform an activity to make a solution in a beaker a add a few crystals of copper sulfate and stir it well in a beaker b add a spatula full of copper sulfate and stir it well suspensions are heterogeneous mixtures in which the solute particles do not dissolve but get suspended throughout the bulk of the solvent left floating around freely in the medium to make a suspension add chalk powder of a beak chalk powder or beet flour in a beaker say c and stir it well the colloids are mixtures in which microscopically dispersed insoluble particles of one substance are suspended in another substance to make a colloidal solution in a beaker d add few drops of milk or ink and stir it well let us know what your observations about all the beakers that is a b c and d are make a na- make a note of the following are the particles in the mixture visible direct a beam of light from a torch through the beaker containing the mixture and observe from the front was the path of the beam of light visible leave the mixtures undisturbed for a few minutes is the mixture stable or do the particles begin to settle after some time filter the mixture is there any residue on the filter paper well solutions are mixtures that do not allow light to pass through them while colloids do the relative proportion of solute and solvent can vary depending upon the amount of solute present in a solution it can either be a dilute solution or a concentrated solution or a saturated solution at any particular temperature a solution that has dissolved as much solute as it is capable of dissolving is said to be a saturated solution in other words when no more solute can be dissolved in a solution at a given temperature it is called a saturated solution the amount of solute present in the saturated solution at this temperature is called its solubility if the amount of solute contained in a solution is less than the saturation level it is called an unsaturated solution let me ask you a simple question what would happen if you were to take a saturated solution at a certain temperature and cool it slowly well when the solution is cooled the solubility of the solute decreases and this causes the solute to precipitate out as crystal in the solutions the solute will crystallize until the solubility of the solute reaches the equilibrium of the solvent the nature of such solutions are still liquid and the crystals are solids let's perform an activity to determine the role of temperature on a solution take approximately 50 ml of water in two separate beakers add salt in one beaker and sugar or barium chloride in the second beaker with continuous stirring when no more sh- solute can be dissolved heat the contents of the beaker to raise the temperature by about 5 degrees celsius start adding the solute again is the amount of salt or sugar or barium chloride that can be dissolved in water at a given temperature the same what do you think let us know in the comment section below do you know that different substances in a given solvent have different solubility at a given temperature 
Now let's see how to calculate the concentration of a solution. Do you know what is concentration? The concentration of a solution is the amount that is the mass or volume of a solute present in a given amount, again mass or volume of solution. We can calculate concentration by mass by mass percentage of a solution and that is the mass of solute divided by mass of solution times 100. Please note that it is the solution mass that we need to divide the mass of solute by and not the mass of the solvent. Now mass by volume percentage. It is the mass of solute divided by volume of solution times 100. And the last one is volume by volume percentage. It is volume of solute divided by volume of solution times 100. For example, a solution containing 40 gram of common salt dissolved in 320 gram of water. The concentration in terms of mass by mass percentage of the solution would be mass of solute which is 40 grams divided by mass of solvent plus mass of solute that is the mass of solution which is 360 grams times 100 pretty simple isn't it let's see one more to make a saturated solution 36 gram of salt is dissolved in 100 grams of water at 293 kelvin let's try to find the concentration at this temperature we know that NaCl or salt is solute and water is solvent because solute is generally present in less quantities than solvent also the substance which is dissolved is called the solute whereas the substance in which it is dissolved is called the solvent now we know that mass of solute which is salt is 36 grams mass of solvent is 100 grams so mass of solution would be 36 plus 100 that is 136 grams so the concentration of the solution would be 36 divided by 136 times 100 moving on suspensions we briefly touched upon the topic of suspensions right non-homogeneous systems in which the solids are dispersed in liquids are called suspensions it is a heterogeneous mixture in which the solute particles do not dissolve but remain suspended throughout the bulk of the solution medium. Particles of a suspension are visible to the naked eye. Now, since the particles are big enough, they are able to scatter a beam of light passing through it and make its path visible. The solute particle settle down when a suspension is left undisturbed. That is, a suspension is unstable. They can be separated from the mixture by the process of filtration. When the particles settle down, the suspension breaks. The particles are not roaming around freely to scatter the light. Hence, it would not scatter the light anymore. If you are liking the video, please hit the like button, share the video and subscribe to the channel. The particles of the colloid, on the other hand, are uniformly spread throughout the solution. Due to the relatively smaller size of the particles as compared to that of a suspension, the mixture appears to be homogeneous. But actually, a colloidal solution is a heterogeneous mixture, for example, milk. And because of the small size of the colloidal particles, we cannot see them with naked eyes. But Colloids are big enough to scatter a beam of light passing through it and make its path visible. Also, they do not settle down when left undisturbed. That is, a colloid is quite stable and hence they cannot be separated from the mixture by the process of filtration. This scattering of a beam of light is called the Tyndall effect after the name of the scientist John Tyndall who discovered this effect. Tyndall effect can also be observed when a fine beam of light enters a room through a small hole. 
This happens due to the scattering of light by the particles of dust and smoke in the air. Tyndall effect can be observed when sunlight passes through the canopy of a dense forest. In the forest, mist contains tiny droplets of water which act as particles of colloid dispersed in the air. The components of a colloidal solution are the dispersed phase and the dispersion medium. The solute-like component or the dispersed particles in a colloid form the dispersed phase and the component in which the dispersed phase is suspended is known as the dispersing medium. Colloids are classified according to the state which is solid, liquid or gas of the dispersing medium and the dispersing and the dispersed phase. For example, fog. It has gas as the dispersing medium and liquid as the dispersed phase. Aerosols. They are colloids with dispersed phase being either liquid or solid. And dispersing medium is gas. Some examples of aerosols are clouds, mist, automobile exhaust, smoke, etc. Foams are colloids with dispersed phase gas and dispersing medium either liquid or solid. For example, the shaving cream is a foam. The rubber that is obtained from the tree, non-vulcanized rubber. The sponge, the pumice stone, etc. Emulsions are colloids with both dispersed phase and dispersing medium are liquid. Some examples are milk, the cream that you use on your face, etc. Salts are colloids with dispersed phase solid and dispersing medium liquid. Some examples are milk of magnesium and mud. Now there are solid salts also. Solid salts are colloids with both the dispersed phase and dispersing medium being solid. Some examples are colored gemstones, milky glass, etc. Now gels. Gels are colloids with dispersed phase liquid and dispersing medium solid. For example, jelly, cheese, butter, etc. Here, you can go through this table to understand the things better. Let's move on. We have learned that most of the natural substances are not chemically pure, right? Different methods of separation are used to get individual components from a mixture. Separation makes it possible to study and use the individual components of a mixture. Now, heterogeneous mixtures can be separated into their respective constituents by simple physical methods like hand picking, sieving, filtration that we use in our day-to-day -day life. Sometimes special techniques have to be used for the separation of the components of a mixture. Let's perform an activity to obtain a dye from ink. Fill half a beaker with water and put a watch glass on the mouth of the beaker. Now put a few drops of ink on the watch glass. Start heating the beaker. Don't heat the ink directly. You will see that evaporation is taking place from the watch glass. Continue to heat as the evaporation goes on and stop heating when you do not see any further change on the watch glass. So what actually happened there? The blue ink is a mixture of water, which is volatile, and dye, which is non-volatile. On heating, water got evaporated from the watch glass, leaving the solute dye. The process involved is evaporation of water. Thus, we can say that we can separate the volatile components from its non-volatile solute by the method of evaporation. Moving on to the next separation technique. How can we separate cream from milk? 
Nowadays, we get full cream, toned, and double toned varieties of milk packed in poly packs or tetra packs in the market. These varieties of milk contain different amounts of fat. Now, take some full cream milk in a test tube, centrifuge it by using a centrifuging machine for 2 minutes. If a centrifuging machine is not available, you can use a milk churner, which is commonly available in the kitchen. What do you observe on churning the milk? Churning the milk includes a physical process of separation of milk particles in which there is no change in composition. On churning the milk, only the separation of components of milk takes place by physical phenomena called centrifugation. The centrifugal force acts on the milk and due to this, the milk separates into cream and skimmed milk. The cream being lighter floats over the skimmed milk and can then be removed. In cases where the solid particles in a liquid are very small and pass through a filter paper, the filtration technique cannot be used for separation. Such mixtures are separated by centrifugation. As we have seen, the principle is that the denser particles are forced to the bottom and the lighter particles stay at the top when spun rapidly. Let's see some applications of centrifugation technique. It is used in diagnostic laboratories for blood and urine tests. It is also used in dairies and home to separate butter from cream. It is used in washing machines to squeeze out water from wet clothes. Do you know what do we do to make paneer? Well, we add a few drops of lemon juice to the milk as it boils. Now what happens? This would give a mixture of particles of solid paneer and liquid. The paneer is then separated by filtering the mixture through a fine cloth or strainer. Let's perform an activity to separate a mixture of two immiscible liquids. Let us try to separate kerosene oil from water using a separating funnel. Pour the mixture of kerosene oil and water in a separating funnel. Let it stand undisturbed for some time so that separate layers of oil and water are formed. Now open the stopcock of the separating funnel and pour out the lower layer of water carefully. Close the stopcock of the separating funnel as the oil reaches the stopcock. To separate mixture of oil and water in the extraction of iron from its soil. These are some of the applications. Now, while we extract iron from its ore, the lightest slag is removed from the top by this method to leave the molten iron at the bottom in the furnace. The principle used is that immiscible liquids separate out in layers depending on their densities. It seems you are liking the video. Well, in that case, do you mind hitting the like button and let us know too? Thank you. How can we separate mixture of salt and camphor? We have learned in the chapter matter in our surroundings that camphor directly changes from solid to gaseous state on heating. So to separate such mixtures that contain a sublimable volatile component from a non-sublimable impurity, the sublimation process is used. Some examples of solids which are sublime are ammonium chloride, naphthalene, and anthracene. Let me ask you an interesting question. Do you think the dye in the black ink is a single color? Let's find out. Take a thin strip of filter paper and draw a line on it using a pencil approximately 3 cm above the low edge. Put a small drop of ink. It should be a water soluble ink. Like you can use sketch pen or fountain pen. And then let it dry. Lower the filter paper into a jar containing water so that the drop of ink on the paper is just above the water level as shown here and leave it undisturbed. Watch carefully as the water rises up on the filter paper. 
you would know that there are different colors on the filter paper strip and the rise of the colored spot of the paper strip shows the solubility of the colored components of ink in water the filter paper takes the more soluble colors with it to the top and less soluble colors are carried up later hence those which rise faster are more soluble and get separated from the mixture the ink that we use has water as the solvent and the dye is soluble in it as the water rises on the filter paper it takes along with it the dye particles usually a dye is a mixture of two or more colors the colored component that is more soluble in water rises faster and in this way the colors get separated chromatography is the technique used for separation of those solutes that dissolve in the same solvent chroma is greek word that means color this technique was first used for separation of colors and hence this name let's see some of the applications of chromatography it is used to separate colors in a dye it is used to separate pigments from natural colors it is also used to separate drugs from blood now the next question is how can we separate a mixture of two miscible liquids do you think that's even possible let's see let us try to separate acetone and water from their mixture take the mixture in a distillation flask and fit it with a thermometer arrange the apparatus as shown here heat the mixture slowly keeping a close watch at the thermometer you would note that the acetone vaporizes condenses in the condenser and can be collected from the condenser outlet you would have noted that when the temperature comes at 56 degrees celsius thermometer reading becomes constant do you know why well this is because this is the boiling point of acetone we can conclude here that the two components could separate because of their difference in the boiling points this method is called distillation it is used for the separation of components of a mixture containing two miscible liquids that boil without de- decomposition and have sufficient difference in their boiling points to separate a mixture of two or more miscible liquids for which the difference in boiling points is less than 25k fractional distillation process is used the apparatus is similar to that for simple distillation except that a fractionating column is fitted in between the distillation flask and the condenser a simple fractionating column is a tube packed with glass beads the beads provide surface for the vapors to cool and condense repeatedly as shown here Let's see some of the applications of fractional distillation. It is used for the separation of different gases from the air and to obtain different fractions from petroleum products. Let's see how do we separate different gases using fractional distillation. Air is first compressed and cooled by increasing the pressure and decreasing the temperature. This gives us liquid air. allow the air to warm up slowly in the fractional distillation column gases are separated at different heights we see that the boiling points in the increasing order here is nitrogen argon oxygen carbon dioxide this means carbon dioxide forms the liquid first and nitrogen make the liquid in the end Now how can we obtain pure copper sulfate from an impure sample let's perform an activity to do that take around 5 g impure sample of copper sulfate impure sample of copper sulfate in a china dish dissolve it in minimum amount of water and filter the impurities out evaporate water from the copper sulfate solution so as to get a saturated solution Cover the solution with a filter paper and leave it undisturbed at room temperature to cool slowly for a day. 
separate the crystals from the liquid in the china dish using filter paper the crystals will get spread on the filter paper and the water will be absorbed by filter paper this process is called crystallization here we observe that the saturated solution when left undisturbed converts to pure crystals of the substance do you think that the crystals look alike let us know in the comment section below crystallization is used to purify some solids for example the salt we get from sea water can have many impurities in it separation of crystals of alum which is pitkari from impure samples is also done using crystallization crystallization technique is better than simple evaporation technique as some solids decompose or some like sugar may get charred on heating to dryness some impurities may remain dissolved in the solution even after filtration on evaporation these contaminate the solid let's see how is the drinking water cleaned in cities drinking water is supplied from water works a flow diagram of a typical water works is shown here as we can see the water from the reservoir is passed through a canal to a tank called sedimentation tank this tank helps the solid substances mixed in water to settle down then it passes to another tank called the loading tank it removes the suspended particles the process in which the suspended particles are removed is called loading then it is passed to the filtration tank to filter all the waste particles this water is passed to another tank to kill bacteria by adding chlorine or ddt this process is called chlorination Finally, this water is sent to the homes. Let's discuss another case of separating two mixtures. How can we separate a mixture containing kerosene and petrol? The difference in their boiling points is more than 25 degrees Celsius and they are miscible with each other. A mixture of two miscible liquids having a difference in their boiling points of more than 25 degrees Celsius can be separated by simple distillation the mixture of kerosene and petrol is taken in a distillation flask with a thermometer fitted arrange a beaker water condenser and a bunsen burner as shown here the mixture is then heated slowly since the boiling point of petrol is less compared to the kerosene it will first undergo vaporization and condense in the water condenser the condensed petrol is co is collected from the condenser outlet whereas kerosene is left behind in the distillation flask we know that properties that can be observed and specified like color hardness rigidity fluidity density melting point boiling point etc are the physical properties the interconversion of states is a physical change because these changes occur without a change in composition and no change in the chemical nature of the substance some examples of physical changes are cutting of trees melting of butter in a pan boiling of water to form steam dissolving common salt in water or making a fruit salad with raw fruits some examples of a chemical change are rusting of a car passing of electric current through water water breaking down into hydrogen and oxygen gases burning of wood burning of paper etc although ice water and water vapor all look different and display different physical properties they are chemically the same now both water and cooking oil are liquids but the chemical characteristics are different they differ in odor and inflammability we know that oil burns in air whereas water extinguishes fire burning is a chemical change 
During this process, one substance reacts with another to undergo a change in chemical composition. Chemical changes. Chemical change brings change in the chemical properties of matter and we get new substance. A chemical change is also called a chemical reaction. During burning of a candle, both physical and chemical changes take place. When candle burns, wax in candle converts from solid into liquid. This is a physical change, as it is a change in state of matter and also can be reversed. However, a wax near the flame burns and converts into carbon dioxide. This carbon cannot be again converted into wax, so this is a chemical change. Let's classify some objects around us as pure objects and mixtures. Examples of pure substances Distilled water, diamond, graphite, raw rubber. While some examples of mixtures are curd, ice cream, kerosene oil, cooking oil, steel, vulcanized rubber, soldier wire, etc. On the basis of the chemical composition, substances can either be classified as elements or compounds. Robert Boyle was the first scientist to use the term element in 1661. Antoine Laurent Lavoisier, a French chemist, was the first to establish an experimentally useful definition of an element. He defined an element as a basic form of matter that cannot be broken down into simpler substances by chemical reactions. Elements can normally be divided into metals, non-metals and metalloids. Metals usually show some or all of the following properties. Like they have a luster that is they are shiny. They have silvery grey or golden yellow color. They conduct heat and electricity. They are ductile that is they can be drawn into wires. Then they are also malleable, that is, they can be hammered into thin sheets. They are sonorous as well, that is, they make a ringing sound when hit. Examples of metals are gold, silver, copper, iron, sodium, potassium, etc. Mercury is the only metal that is liquid at room temperature. Non-metals usually show some or all of the following properties. They display a variety of colors. They are poor conductors of heat and electricity. They are not lustrous, sonorous or malleable. Examples of non-metals are hydrogen, oxygen, iodine, carbon, bromine, chlorine, etc. Some elements have intermediate properties between those of metals and non-metals. They are called metalloids like boron, silicon, germanium, etc. The number of elements known at present are more than 100. 92 elements are naturally occurring and the rest are man-made. Majority of the elements are solid. 11 elements are in gaseous state at room temperature. Two elements are liquid at room temperature, which are mercury and bromine. Elements like gallium and cesium become liquid at a temperature slightly above room temperature. A compound is a substance composed of two or more elements, chemically combined with one another in a fixed proportion. What do we get when two or more elements are combined? Let's perform an activity to find out. Mix and crush 10 gram iron fillings and 6 gram sulfur powder. Keep half of the mixture separately and call it mix 1. And heat the other half strongly till red hot. Let's call it mix 2. Remove mix 2 from the flame and let it cool. Now check for magnetism in the mix 2. Bring a magnet near it and check if it is attracted towards the magnet. You would observe that it has lost its magnetism whereas mix 1 still has it. Compare the texture and color of mix 1 and mix 2. 
you would notice that mix 1 and mix 2 showed different properties though the starting materials were the same. The properties of the mixture are the same as that of its constituents. Now add carbon disulfide to mix 2, stir well and filter. Add dilute sulfuric acid or dilute hydrochloric acid to mix 1 and mix 2. It leads to a chemical change and thus form a compound which has totally different properties compared to the combining elements. The composition of a compound is the same throughout. We can also observe that the texture and color of the compound are the same throughout. You would also notice that both mix 1 and mix 2 obtained a gas on adding dilute sulfuric acid or dilute hydrochloric acid. However, the smell of the gas in both the cases is different. The gas obtained in mix 1 is hydrogen which is colorless and odorless. Now you can perform all the above steps with both the elements iron and sulfur separately. The gas obtained by group 2 that is mix 2 is hydrogen sulfide which is a colorless gas with the smell of rotten eggs. Now properties of mixtures. Elements or compounds just mix together to form a mixture and no new compound is formed. It has a variable composition and show the properties of the constituent elements. The constituents can be separated fairly easily by physical methods. Properties of compounds. Elements react to form new compounds. The composition of each new substance is always fixed. The new substance has totally different properties. And the constituents can be separated only by chemical or electrochemical reactions. Let's conclude this chapter by going through the types and properties of different types of matter. Matter can be solid, liquid or gas. It can be a pure substance or it can be mixtures. Pure substance can be elements which cannot be broken down to simpler substances or compounds which have fixed composition can be broken down into elements by chemical or electrochemical reactions. Mixtures can either be homogeneous which have uniform composition or heterogeneous which have non-uniform composition. Hope you found the video interesting. Please share with other grade 9, grade nine students too. Let us know which part did you like the best. Please, please let us know in the comment section below. We love hearing from you. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Do check out our other videos too. Stay kind. Be good. Bye-bye.